Paul, thank you very much indeed for taking part and, and recording an interview for our Peter Cushing documentary, Peter Cushing in his own words. Yes. So tell us a little bit about your background with, with Elstree, your, your history with it as a studio. Well, it goes back a, a while. Um, my father was in a props man in sound effects. So I literally grew up in a film town because I was born in Borenwood. So I grew up in a film town surrounded by film people. And my father was in the business, so I would uh, hear stories and meet people and so on. Uh, the earliest time I ever came to Elstree Studios uh, was 1960, when my father said there's an old American star here that he must get his autograph. And uh, I was you know, you know, quite young, and I thought, well, it didn't quite impress me that much. Uh, but there's this tall, elderly gentleman and so on. His name was Gary Cooper. And I still kept that 10 by 8 signed by Gary Cooper. And my earliest film memory of a film set was School for Scoundrels with Terry Thomas and Alistair Sim. And again, they were shooting the scene at the top of my road. So I just literally had to walk up the road to see them filming this scene where uh, um, Alistair Sim is being trailed by Terry Thomas and they get on a bus at a bus stop and uh, that was the scene that was being shot. Uh, and so that was my first experience of seeing a film crew and all the paraphernalia in those days, even for a simple little shot like that, it was all very union driven and there's a lot of people there and uh, big cameras and so on. Uh, and then, uh, as I say, I came down and visit sets. Then in the mid 70s, I was asked to write a weekly newspaper column because I was coming down and meeting people. They said, well, why don't you write about it? And so the public can get a look behind the scenes and in those days, we didn't have closed sets as anywhere near like today. Everything's closed now. You know, I, I wouldn't be allowed to walk anywhere near uh, Strictly Come Dancing, for instance. But in those days, I could get an interview with David Niven or Charlton Heston or you know, Sophia Loren, all these people, marvellous names. And you speak to the unit publicist and he would say, yes, you know. then I would write about it. And I've been doing that for 41 years now. So that was the side that kept me interested. And then in in the late yeah, late seventies or so, I got involved with them, uh, became a friend of the managing director here, and so we would do special anniversary events that I would organise at the studio for different celebrations, anniversaries, which again would bring back old stars, which was great fun because I loved it as a film fan. It was my excuse to invite Anna Eagle or Douglas Fairbanks Jr. or Trevor Howard or whatever. I mean, these were mm, names, great names, great names, and. Uh, and they would always come, I and mean, John Mills and all this, Hayley Mills, and all, always come. Not, not like today where you talk about fee, you know, well, how much are you going to pay me or something. And none of that whatsoever. Uh, it was always for the love of Elstree and memories of it, they would come. And, and then in the 86, Canon Films bought Elstree Studios from Thorn EMI. And sadly, they were in a mess as a company. And they sold it on two years later to Brent Walker, which was another company heading for a rapid downfall and dragged Elstree down with it. So I became chairman of the campaign to save Elstree and that went on for eight years and it was a, a long slog and at one point Elstree was closed for two years, semi-derelict, and Brent Walker ripped out anything you could find, office furniture, uh, copper wiring, monopoles from the studio, uh, um, carpet tiles, kitchen sinks, I mean, this projection theatre, all the chairs, the screen, the projectors, all went. And uh, they would say to me, oh, you can show people around if you want to, you might want to buy it as a studio. But it was it was a floating wreck. The underground car park, which houses like 200 cars, that was partly flooded and blue asbestos was floating around in the water. So that was a no-go area. It had to be sealed off for health and safety reasons. Shocking. I, I mean, the place was almost where you would have said there's moss and fungi growing on the in the dressing rooms where the flat roofs were and were leaking. It was unheated. Mm. Uh, and people said to me, you've lost it. This is not coming back, not from here. It's not going to come back. And 12 acres of the site was sold for Tesco supermarket. And that meant a demolition of certain sound stages. And the old front, which was very familiar to people, went. And the sound production side of it all went and this big Star Wars stage at the back went, and they said, you're left with just three stages, seven, eight, nine, and some other buildings, but it's, it's not gonna happen now. But I didn't believe in that. I thought, come on, you stay in the fight. We'll fight them all the way to the courts. And luckily, 
we won. Luckily, at that point in time, Hartsmere Borough Council were very cash rich because, not like local authorities today, they had sold off their housing stock and had about £60 million in the capital account, which could only be spent on capital projects. So they bought Elsie Studios for a knockdown price, less than £2 million, for what, 15 and a half acres. Now, bear in mind, 10 years earlier, Tesco had bought 12 acres for £19 million. So it was a good bargain. On the books alone, it would be a good bargain. But we then, then I became chairman of uh, the um, um, partnership company to relaunch it. Mm. And I did that for four years. And during that time, we rebuilt two massive sound stages at the back, the now called George Lucas stages. We built those, biggest in Europe. And we uh, refurbished 7, 8, and 9. We refurbished all the buildings, spent £10 million. Pounds, five million on refurbishment, five million on two new stages. And we turned it around. And now it's making a healthy profit. It's paying back the ratepayers of Hartsmere Borough, the equivalent of about 15% of their rates every year. So it's a healthy, functioning, popular, back on its old feet studio that's been here since 1926. And it's wonderful to see all these audience today turn up for Strictly Come Dancing or uh, all the other TV shows they do here. Mm. Uh, and and you see young people working here now who weren't born when we did the cap campaign uh, as runners and so on. You know, they've got to be 30 years old now, uh, 30 years ago. So anybody under 30 wasn't even born, let alone working. So they don't know what happened in those bygone era days. But to see them now employed here and getting a new start and a new business, that's wonderful. I think it's, it's a wonderful legacy. And... and we were so, so lucky to have the support we got from the town, the town people, the council, the industry. And it just shows what a little man can do sometimes, even when you're fighting 48 banks who owned Brent Walker in the city and were just asset stripping everything to get their money back. And they're just suits that you couldn't deal with easily. And people say, oh, you can't win against that. But there you are, we won. So perhaps it's a bit of magic attached to Elstree, perhaps. Perhaps that's the secret. 